Service is a great healer, and I had a broken heart after September 11, and I just wanted to find some purpose, some meaning, some new direction for channeling my energy, and it turned out that uh, I was called to do this service for our veterans. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm J.R. Martinez, and welcome to Rebirth. On this show, we talk to individuals that have had to reimagine, reinvent, and recreate themselves in order to grow. And we're going to learn how they use those experiences to propel them into who they are today. I'm excited to share my next guest with you. Many know him as an award-winning actor or from his iconic role as Lieutenant Dan in the film Forrest Gump. But I know him as a humanitarian, an incredible advocate for the military community, and I'm honored to be able to call him a friend. I always knew of all the incredible work he has done and continues to do for our service members and first responders. But I was excited to talk more about how he found his calling and purpose to service. In our conversation, you will learn about the catalyst for starting his passionate work for our military community and more. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, an advocate, a voice, and an incredibly passionate and giving, grateful American, Gary Sinise. Gary, thank you for joining the show. Thanks for having me, JR. It's good to see you, bud. Yeah, it's great, man. It's great to see you. You know, um, I think where I think what's really important is to really share is as much as I want to get into all of your personal accolades, you know, from a career standpoint, acting and I think what's what speaks volumes of who you are and encompasses is, I you know, I spend a little bit of time just kind of doing a little bit more research and wanted to make sure I did you justice. And uh, as I went and looked on, you know, Googled Gary Sinise, I put Gary Sinise and the first four or five things that popped up was your foundation. And as you're well aware, most actors and most individuals that are in the entertainment space, when you Google their names, usually the, one of the first thing that pops up is their website. The second thing that pops up is their IMDb page to talk about all their you know, accomplishments. And mm-hmm. I think it speaks volumes about how for you, it clearly what matters more is all this incredible work that you've been doing. And I know we're going to get into that. And I want to talk about your incredible foundation that has been around for nine years. But before all of that, I think... I would love to kind of go back to the beginning of the book. And for me, I've always asked myself the question, what drives him? What, what is it that sparked this agenda, this purpose, this passion to want to serve our military and be a voice when he himself has never worn the uniform in the traditional manner? And what I learned is that, well, your grandfather served, your father served, your brother-in-law served. You've had a line of, I mean, you named your son after your brother-in-law, Mac, who, you know, we lost too early and due to an illness, but who was this incredible individual. And I mean, can you talk about that? I mean, did, did that ha- influence you when you were younger? Did you guys talk about it? Was this something that you said, hey, I might not join the military, but I want to do something for the military? I think, it, thank you, JR. It, it, it evolved over a series, you know, of of uh, relationships and meetings and uh, events and things that that accumulated over time to the to the point where many many seeds were planted along the way in the 70s and 80s and 90s and and through my childhood and everything that sort of grew and manifested into a full-time service uh, mission uh after September 11th and uh, what happened there and, and who, who could have known that so many things would sort of be preparing me in a way to, to kind of take up the charge and to take action to go out and, and, and play a role in helping our, our military and our veteran community as, as uh, I'm currently uh, doing now. Uh, but but they did. There were, like you say, you know, my family members, um, many on my side of the family, the two uncles in World War II, my grandfather in World War I, my, my dad in the Navy during the 50s. 
uh, early 50s when I was born. And uh, then, uh, you know, I met the love of my life and two of her brothers uh, were had been in the army in Vietnam. Her sister had joined the army. Her sister married a, a Vietnam veteran, combat medic, uh, who stayed in the army for about 22 years. They had a son. He was in the army. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, it just goes on and on. And a lot of that was in preparation for, you know, set the set the table, if you will, for uh, what would happen later on. Um, I started focusing very, very specifically back in the 80s on supporting Vietnam veterans. Right. And helping them and in the Chicago area in various ways. You read in the book uh, some of those early things that really just really in, embedded themselves in sort of my soul and that, that they would take, kind of take flight in the nineties after I played uh, Lieutenant Dan and started uh, supporting our wounded. And then September 11th came along and it was just like, well, what am I going to do to help my country here? I'm not in uniform, but uh, I need, I need to do something. And right. uh, I knew that kind of employing my efforts towards supporting the men and women who were responding to that terrible event, uh, having been involved with veterans, you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s, I knew that's where my energy was going. And I did it in various ways, uh, JR. I mean, I met you uh, because what I was doing back then, you know, some of the first things I would do is raise my hand for the USO. Of course, I was an actor. and You know, what do you do? You know, you're an entertainer. So you volunteer for the USO. I started doing all that. But then I started um, and I just kept doing that, you know, regularly. And, and that led to me meeting a lot of different people that were uh, had their own military support nonprofit organizations. And. And I was like, well, what can I do to help you uh, do more to help our veterans and do more to help our service members? So I would, I would just show up at events and and uh, show up and you know do PSAs or raise money or whatever it was. And and you and I met because I had volunteered to bring my band uh, to support the Coalition to Salute America's Heroes back in in 2004. You became a spokesperson for that. So, uh, you know the the year after you were injured and. Uh, we met at that very first Road to Recovery event down in Orlando at D Disney World. And I had just, I had seen what they were doing and they were just getting started. And I was trying to help a lot of nonprofits who were getting started to do more. And I thought, well, the way that I can help do more for a lot more people is to help a lot of different nonprofits. Right. So I was raising my hand and donating money and, band, and my band and all that kind of stuff to a lot of organizations and that was one of them. And I, re I remember you, I was signing autographs uh, after the concert or something at a, at a long table. And I remember you coming up, um, you know, and we, we had a conversation. That's when we first really met. You had been at, the, you know, you were a spokesperson for that organization. And there were, uh, gosh, there were three or 400 wounded veterans at that first a conference, I remember, and I, I kind of came in, I think we kind of kicked that conference off with a big concert, I think. Yes. And uh, then I sat there and signed autographs, and it, it was very humbling because there were a lot of, you know, guys, guys like you that had been blown up and burned and, and you know, amputees and and whatnot, and uh, it, we held a concert at the House of Blues, as, as I recall, at at Disney World, and then there was an autograph session afterwards. I think at the hotel or something, and yeah. and that I remember very specifically. You in line and coming up and standing there. We we had a conversation, and then little did I know that later on you'd become a dance phenomenon, and uh, you know <laughs> all that. If you recall, there was because uh, you came to that that conference uh, for like the next four years or so, and and I remember probably in two thousand six or seven, I. I have a memory of actually coming on stage and dancing because you, you, your band would constantly pull up vets, you know, and their family yes. would <laughs> dance. And, and in some cases, the lead singer would then pass the mic off to a vet and it would sound horrible, but it was nobody cared. I know it was fun. <laughs> and so you should have seen then that that was, I was laying the foundation of my dancing roots. <laughs> like it's you were practicing. 
for for who who could have who could have predicted? <laughs> you know, Gary, this this podcast is is called Rebirth, and the whole idea of Rebirth is that all of us throughout life we have, you know, as you know, a lot of ver- veterans refer to the day that they were injured as their alive day. I refer to that day as my rebirth. I truly believe that elements of me who I was before my injury died and there were new components of me that were born on that day. And so this podcast being named Rebirth, it encompasses in trying to highlight all of the rebirths that so many of us have throughout the course of our lives. Meaning every single day you make choices and decisions that can change the course of your day, your week, your month, your year. And through those decisions and choices, it leads us to what we hope is our purpose and our passion and what gives gives us fulfillment. And before we get into like a lot of that work and, and that, that you currently are doing today and you're so focused on, have been focused on for the last, you know, 25, 30 years, you know, I, I really want to talk about how you as a, as a young kid, you know, I can relate to a lot of the early parts of your book where you said schooling, you know, just you weren't thriving in school. You know, you didn't get the best grades. Neither did I. You moved around a lot and it was really challenging for you to find a community for yourself until one day you're walking down the hall and Barbara Patterson, who is the theater teacher, comes up to you and your friends and says, hey, I have, you guys look like you could play in the West Side Story, the criminals or something of that nature. (laughs) That changed everything for you. Uh, You know, I mean, we have these moments in life where if we just happen to not be there, you know, uh, life could have uh, gone a very different way. But I just happened to be standing in a hallway and uh, the drama teacher walked down the hall and looked at me and told me to come audition for uh, West Side Story. And then she blew off down the hall and I, you know, thought about it and I showed up at the audition and I got a part in the play. And that she, that started, you know, I haven't stopped acting since. I mean, that was when I was 16 years old. And it was a moment that thrust my life into kind of this, you know, theater and film and all of that. Uh, I started a theater company after that uh, when I got out of high school. And that, that company is over 45 years old now. We're building a new building. We've got, we own five buildings. It started with nothing. It was just kids. Yeah. putting on plays, and now it's a giant Chicago institution, interna- internationally known. We have a lot of actors that have come out of there. So who would have thought that, you know, just standing in that hallway in 1971 when the drama teacher walked by, that it would turn into a whole thing, and, and that's what I would do for my life. But, you know, because of that career, I've been able to do a lot of wonderful things. Yeah, but I think that's the key, right, is that all of us are – face those moments in our lives, right? And and you didn't have to accept, as you said in the book, you, you know, it wasn't necessarily a request. It was almost like you you interpreted it as a as a challenge, a dare. And but you didn't have to accept that. You didn't have to show up the, you know, the following day and go and audition. And the key, I think, what's really incredible is that you're willing to be vulnerable enough to go into that new space, which acting as you are well aware, you have to be vulnerable and show so much of, of yourself and, and these different roles that you're playing, but you get a part, but you only have like two words or three words in the <laughs> play. And that, that was satisfying for you because at the end, when the show is over, the leads pulled you up to the front and asked you to stand in the front with the leads of the show and take a bow. And you talked about how you were just overwhelmed with emotion because now you had found a community, which you didn't really feel like you had up until that point. That, that you know, I, I, I get choked up when I think about that moment. It was so many, many years ago, but it was the beginning, you know. People always ask me, what's, a, what's your favorite thing you've ever done or the most important thing you've ever done? And, you know, is it Forrest Gump or is it just this movie or that TV show or whatever? You know, among the top five things is always that very first moment. Uh, I'll never forget. I just, that's why I took so much time in the book to describe what it was like to be baptized into this new (laughs) world of theater and acting. And then the chapter is called Baptism, where I was, I was just submerged in this water 
And uh, I came up from it just feeling like I had a whole new purpose and a whole new direction. And all I wanted to do from that point on was do more of it. And right. so many good things have happened because of that. You know, like I said, my theater company was born and, and now it's very, very successful. And, and uh, I've had a wonderful career that I've been able to go, go on and do a lot of really interesting and, and wonderful things, a lot of great experiences. And I've had success that I've been able to channel and, you know, kind of repurpose into something positive for, for other people, our veterans and our military community, our Gold Star families and our wounded. And, and uh, you know, if I hadn't had that career, would I have done that? Maybe, you know, I met my, you know, as long as I would have met my wife and kind of been sort of re-educated about what it was like for our Vietnam veterans to come home and not be treated well and not get the support they needed. Uh, that was a catalyst for me to kind of take up the charge today to try to do as much I, as I can for, for our, you know, current conflict, uh, warriors that are, that are struggling and, and suffering. So yeah, I've, I've learned a lot of wonderful things along the way. It's, um, uh, I, I say in the book, you know, service is a great healer mm -hmm. and I had a broken heart after September 11th and I'm just. Did, wanted to find some purpose, uh, some meaning, some new direction for channeling my energy, and 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 I it turned out that uh, I was called to do this service work for our veterans. Yeah, well, it's interesting, right? When you later in life, when we grow up a little bit and become a little bit more mature, one would hope that we're able to look back at our lives and say, "Wow, that one decision, how it." catapults and propels every other thing to happen in my life because you mentioned you know meeting the love of your life Laura. but had you not potentially accepted the challenge to act you probably wouldn't have met her um because obviously you know at her company steppenwolf that's where you guys met and that's where your love started and your story began but you know so so i i find it really fascinating because not only in that moment you accepted the opportunity to act but then after that you know, you get so immersed into acting, into theater, and you and some buddies start Steppenwolf, which, as you mentioned, has now become this world-renowned, respected institution. But it wasn't easy to start that. And you were working off jobs just to, you know, you and your buddies were working off jobs just to try to help put up enough money to put on plays and get people out. But then the one play that you did when you had the the title of AD now for the theater company. And you find this play called Tracers. And that was something that I believe in many ways, as you said, there are many highlights in your career, but Tracers and how it was embraced by the veteran community and how you guys eventually turned it into every Tuesday night, having veterans come and watch the show. I mean, that stood with you, didn't it? There, there's no question of the significance of that particular play in the story of, you know, getting involved with supporting our veterans. Um, this is back in the early 80s. And uh, this particular play, I was, uh, you know, having had many discussions with my wife's brothers about their service in Vietnam and what it was like to come home and and I had, uh, I was kind of re-educated by her brothers. And I started to think about what I was doing in high school during the Vietnam War when they were over in the jungle. And I was playing rock and roll and do, putting on plays in high school. And, and I started to have kind of a guilty feeling when I was listening to them that even though it was on the nightly news every night of, uh, the number of wounded and killed that were during that war, um, it was kind of going over my head. It was something distant. It was like happening over there. And I was focused on playing my guitar and chasing girls around. And, yeah. and it, that was something else until I met these Vietnam veterans. And they really opened my eyes to a lot of things. So as artistic director of Steppenwolf, I very much wanted to try to, find a theater piece that would tell the story of our Vietnam veterans. And I, I started looking and 
I found this play that was being done in Los Angeles called Tracers that was written by a group of Vietnam veterans, mm -hmm. and they were performing it themselves on stage. They got together, they talked about their experiences, they wrote it all down, and then they started acting it out on stage every night, and it was a powerful show. And I went out to Los Angeles. I was in Chicago where my theater company was, and I went out and saw it two nights in a row and just begged them to let me do it at Steppenwolf. They eventually let me do it. And uh, it was it was something that uh, that really started off, uh, as you mentioned, you know, we, we let veterans in every Tuesday night, and the word spread throughout the veteran community in Chicago that this play was being done. And next thing we knew, veterans were lining up out the door, and we could only fit 200 in there because we only had 200 seats. And every Tuesday night, it was just packed, and it was really galvanizing, you know, for me to, to see that and to see those veterans experience that show. It was very powerful, right. and I'll never forget it. And, then, and it plays a significant role in, in the, the Gary Sinise Helps Veterans story that, that is throughout mm -hmm. the book of Grateful America. Yeah. It wasn't until, you know, Forrest Gump, you know, the role that so many of us, you know, remember you from and obviously your band that has traveled all over the world. Uh, as I guess you could refer to them in your case uh, as deployments, because Lord knows you've you've been I mean, I read in the book and nobody knows. Right. Nobody has an idea. And this part of the book I could relate to. And what I mean is that in those early days when I got involved as a spokesman for, you know, the coalition and a couple of other nonprofits, what I found similar to you was purpose. And my purpose was to serve and I can serve in this different capacity. And it drove me to the point where I always tell the story of, I remember one particular incident having a 13 hour surgery on a Thursday and on the following Monday, jumping on a plane to go do a week of press on behalf of the nonprofit. And so many people, of course, the staff at the hospital, my mother were like, you got to recover, you have to heal, you have to take time. And I was like, there is no time. There are veterans and families out there that are suffering, you know, and the issues then were very different than what they are today, but they're suffering. And when I read your book, I'm reading about how you're doing after Lieutenant Dan, after Forrest Gump, after 9-11, you get so embedded, immersed with doing all this work with the USO and all of these various nonprofits that by that time, you're in New York working on a show, but on the weekends, you're touring with your band. You're going overseas. Every moment you had free, you dedicated your, lives, your life at that point to serve our service members. Now, I, I, I want to use the rest of the time that we have because I, I, I want to encourage everyone to go pick up Grateful American, to buy it, to read it, and to be hopefully be inspired by your path and your journey personally, but then also how you've turned it into now a life of service. But I want to get into the Gary Sinise Foundation. Uh, you mentioned supporting all these various nonprofits that were doing a lot of great things, but they were starting and none of us really in many ways knew what we were doing. We just knew we wanted to be part of the solution. But your organization has been around now for, what is it, nine years? Nine um, years. Yeah, nine years building, you know, you have a RISE program, bu building smartly adapted homes for veterans. You work with first responders. You work with, you know, Gold Star families. I mean, you do so much. But I know now during this time of COVID, your foundation has started this new initiative, which is called the COVID-19 Combat Service. And I'd love to let you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, First Responders um, has been a part of, you know, supporting First Responders, part of my, my mission for, from the beginning. Um, and it's because of September 11th and, and getting involved in the New York Fire Department and supporting the various organizations there that were helping the firefighters, helping the families through that. And I befriended many, many pals there and uh, just started supporting them in various ways. So when I started my foundation, first responder outreach was, was always a part of it. And, you know, and that's just ramped up every year since the foundation started. Uh, now our first responders are out there on the front lines and we're, you know, my foundation has always had some flexibility to go where the needs were in, in this, mm. in this 
community of our defenders is what I call them. That, you know, our defenders are military veterans, our, our families, our, you know, our gold star families, our children who sacrifice, our wounded, uh, our first responders, police, firefighters, EMTs, and, and, and now our healthcare work. So we want to, we want to play a role in supporting the people that are out on the front lines battling this battle, right? So we started the emergency COVID-19 combat service uh, to raise additional money for the foundation. And we've sent out over $800,000 already uh, buying personal protective equipment, uh, decontamination units, masks, food at hospitals, you name it. We're, we're trying to support to keep those people strong and to make sure that they're safe and they have the equipment they need. So I encourage people to go to the Gary Sinise Foundation. Check out that initiative if you can. But on the website of the Gary Sinise Foundation, you can see you can see multiple programs operating in various areas of need. And that's because before I started the foundation, that's what I was doing. I was supporting a lot of different charities, uh, military nonprofits that were doing a lot of different types of things. You know, are right. the DAV, the coalition, you know, all, all these uh, organizations that were, were uh, hope for the warriors uh, focused on our wounded, right? And then Gold Star families uh, through TAPS and uh, our Snowball Express program for the children of our fallen heroes. And there's, you know, entertainment with the USO to lift spirits. Everything we do at the Gary Sinise Foundation, the fundamental core and heartbeat of that begins with wanting to make somebody feel better, mm. right? That's why I went to the hospitals, right? You go to the hospitals and you visit those rooms so you can lift those those wounded service members up and their families are there going through those long rehabilitations over and over year after year, multiple surgeries, as you say. And why do I go to the hospital? I, because I want to make them feel better. Yeah. Uh, why do I go to a military base and play music? I just want to lift them up. Let make them feel better, make them feel stronger. You know, why do we build houses for our wounded to take the stress off that family so they don't have to worry about their mortgage and all those kind of things? Everything at the Gary Sinise Foundation, the core of it and the heartbeat of it is mental health and making somebody feel better. And that's that's what I wanted to do. So that's you know, having yeah, I remember sitting down with the lawyers and they said, Okay, what's your thing gonna be at the Gary Sinise Foundation? Are you gonna do this thing? <laughs> And I said, well, we're going to do a lot of things because that's all I basic, basically knew. I learned a lot of wonderful things from a lot of people that were out there doing a lot of wonderful things. Yeah, as you know, you know, one glove does not fit all, right? Like you can't approach every single veteran and family member with the same set of skills and programs because everybody everybody's going to have a different need. And as you touched on, obviously you've done a lot of work with Snowball Express, uh, which is helping the, the children of those fallen service members. Uh, TAPS obviously is doing the same work, helping with grief with those that have lost a loved one in combat. You know, Gary, you know, and I spend a lot of my time sharing a lot of this information, hopefully trying to inspire people and share something with people that gets them to understand what every single one of us can do. What do you say to everybody listening and watching at this moment in, in, in order to get them not only inspired and personally in their lives, because you yourself have an incredible story of how you got even from a career standpoint to where you are, and you never quit, you never quit. And the odds were against you in so many ways. But what do you say to that same person and say, hey, listen, a life of service is incredibly rewarding, and this is what you can do. It gives it it, it gives purpose, you know. Uh, I've been blessed in so many ways, Jr. Uh, we've had our challenges, no no doubt. I write about some of those in the book for sure. Uh, but I've been also been blessed in, in in so many ways, and and to be able to give back and to remember, just simply remember where freedom comes from, that it has to be provided by somebody. Hmm. It has to be protected and fought for and defended. Uh, we don't just get handed this freedom. There are many, many places on this earth where they're in jeopardy all the time uh, because somebody's got a, more guns and somebody's got a bigger sword and they're going to they're gonna tell you what to do. Yes, sir. We have a military uh, that, that fights for freedom and defends freedom. And I... I 
value my freedom. So I know where it comes from. That's one of the things I'll, I'll leave you with this. The National Memorial Day concert, which is coming up on Sunday, and it's uh, you and I always see each other every year at the National Memorial Day Parade. Obviously, this year it's going to be different because we're not live in front of the Capitol the way we are uh, usually. Uh, we got 200,000 people out in front of the Capitol, and Joe Montaigne and I co-host the show. That is a is a perfect example of what you're talking about. That is a moment for the national for our national citizenry to pay respect to those who have fallen for freedom. Mm. And we, we take that moment to do that. I know where my freedom comes from. I value it. And I, I value the people that fight for it and protect it. That's you, my friend. You've sacrificed for freedom. I don't take what you do for granted. That's why I wrote the book. I wanted people to know that. And if I can inspire others to recognize you and your fellow service members and what you do for us, and to just give you a pat on the back and tell you thank you, and to make sure that if there's some way that you can support, you do it, then that's the way that I can serve. Well, sir, I, I, I first and foremost want to thank you for your, your service, for your family service, because I know with all of this incredible work comes a great deal of sacrifice on behalf of your family as well, of allowing Gary Sinise to go and to be in other places than maybe where he'd want to be and where they'd want him is at home. And that is something that as much as I thank you, I thank your family as well for lending you to us. I thank you for your voice. I thank you for your advocacy. I thank you for your heart. I thank you for your passion. I also want to say that I often find myself roped into this space of where you're so busy doing that you even wonder, am I making a difference? Am I impacting? And I don't know if that ever crosses your mind, sir, but I hope that if there is a moment where it does cross into your mind and you're wondering, I could do more, I hope that you remember something that I'm sharing with you and so many others I'm sure have shared. You are making a difference. You have made a difference and you will continue to make a difference and you are changing lives and masses. And for that, I just thank you. I am honored to call you a friend. I am honored to. Uh, you know, have witnessed all the incredible things that you've done because I'll tell you this, and I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, but one of the things that I always looked up to was how you leveraged and utilized your platform on television to talk about what was important to you. And that was something I learned to do through my small stints that I had on television to leverage that opportunity to inspire and educate the world. And I thank you for being a leader. And, uh, Gary, thank you for so much for coming on. Um, again, here it is, Grateful American, a journey from self to service. Uh, Gary Sinise, thank you for all the incredible work that you're doing. Blessings to you and your family. And uh, just keep up the great work. And pretty soon we'll be able to have that big celebration in D.C. or anywhere else, uh, you know, reminding the country and our world of those selfless individuals every day uh, that are serving on our behalf. God bless you, buddy. Thank you for that. And thank you for having me on. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope you check out the Gary Sinise Foundation, which is doing incredible work and add Grateful American to your reading list. His journey from self to service is fascinating educating and inspiring i hope you learned something new today and some inspiration you can take along now don't forget to subscribe i will be dropping new episodes weekly available on apple spotify or wherever you get your podcast from thank you